Before I start this episode, I want to say that I really appreciate those of you who tune in. I knew when I posted last week's video that I was going to catch it, and I was right. I lost subscribers, my view count is down again, and I suspect that this will happen more often from now on, especially since I'm not about to shift my topics or my opinions around just to keep the right people happy. The topics I cover are topics which interest me, and I think that they are important subjects. My opinions, while they may not make certain individuals overly thrilled, are my own, honestly held opinions. My style of videos may not stand out from the crowd, and it may not hold the interest of my audience, but then again, that might be because the sort of people who would watch my content don't learn about my content. I need some help from my audience. I am sharing the link for my uploads on Twitter, Minds, and Discord, but it's not enough to really springboard my channel up to where I want to be. So, if you will help me out... First, click one of those thumbs. I don't care which, up or down. Tell me if you liked the video or disliked it. Second, comment on the video. Tell me why you liked it or disliked it. Third, and this is the big ask, if you like the video, then please share it everywhere online that you go, and with everyone whom you think should watch it. I hate asking for help. It's anathematic to me. But I really need your help, folks, if I want to keep growing. I appreciate anything that you are willing to do, even if it's just watching long enough to give me a view. Now, on with the show. It's autumn now. The trees are starting to look like they are catching fire in slow motion as the leaves change. The summer heat is finally starting to give way to some decent weather, too. It's one of my favorite times of the year, and I don't think that I'm alone in that opinion. So, naturally, national politics has to screw up everyone's mood, doesn't it? It's a primary year, and that means that the field of challengers is starting to narrow. It also means that another round of attacks has started against the incumbent, just like always. But when the incumbent is Donald J. Trump, one knows that the DNC is going to pull out all of the stops. One also knows that everything that the president did, does, or will do is going to be spun as the end of the world as we know it. His mere presence will provoke glares of hatred from those who know him only through what is reported on him. Time to sit back with a mug of spiced cider beside the fire, watch American politics erupt again, and enjoy a few roasted opinions, in other words. Back a while ago, when Congress was seriously pursuing impeachment against Trump for Russian collusion, I said that I believed that Congress was going to keep the impeachment hearings going in order to affect the results of the general election. Nancy Pelosi didn't want to impeach at that time, remember? She said that there wasn't enough evidence to sway votes and not enough votes in the Senate to remove the president. Various representatives wanted to push for impeachment, but Pelosi kept ensuring that the articles introduced were tabled until later at every turn. This isn't a new tactic. Every president from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump has faced at least one attempt to impeach him. For Reagan, it was the Iran-Contra affair. For George H.W. Bush, the Persian Gulf War. For Bill Clinton, lying to Congress. For George W. Bush, it was the Iraq War. For Barack Obama, a myriad of rumors about everything from his citizenship to his implementation of Obamacare. Impeachment was leveled at all of them, and always by a member or members of the opposite party. After the election of 2018, I said that this process was critical to keeping Trump's polling numbers down and to fire up the base for the 2020 general election. If impeachment was going to be used, it was going to be a political weapon instead of a general movement with bipartisan support. The goal was to leverage both the White House and the Senate majority in one move. And that takes timing. Now here we are in September. There has been a whistleblower report made on the president alleging that he has done something deeply troubling. Just as the furor from that was fresh in everyone's minds, a report came out that Trump had begged the Ukrainian president to investigate Joe Biden's son for corruption. And right on the heels of those revelations came a storm of calls in the press to impeach Donald Trump for using his political influence to leverage an election. Surprise, surprise. Nancy Pelosi finally had just the accusation she wanted to use to push forward with impeachment inquiries. She even has the transcript of the call, which the Democrats claim 
prove that Trump did what he is accused of doing, and the Republicans' claim proves that he didn't. And the whistleblower's complaint as well, which confirms that the whistleblower didn't directly witness anything and yet reports quite a bit of secondhand knowledge that looks bad as it is presented in the report. The inquiries have begun, and the partisan divide is on full display in the House of Representatives. So, let's look at the facts and see what they look like. Donald Trump's election victory was an unpleasant surprise to many people. Trump? Really? This guy is rude, crude, crass, bombastic, and unfiltered. He pisses off more people by accident every day than most people can manage to piss off on purpose in a lifetime. Yet he's the one that's selected by the majority of the electors in the Electoral College? Yep, because the pundits and talking heads forgot something that reporters and pollsters seem to ignore on purpose. Most people in the United States are sick of being ignored by elitists and the intelligentsia. More Americans wanted to discuss jobs, wage growth, and economic development in 2016 after eight years of stagnation. They didn't want to hear another round of what sounded to them like the inevitable transfer of global influence from the U.S. to the EU. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't care about the environment or immigration or trade or social justice. It means that they don't consider global climate change, open borders, social programs, and the redefinition of hate speech as the most important problems of the day. Now, let's review. Trump ran on creating jobs, correcting the global trade imbalances that the U.S. has faced for decades, expanding the economy, and creating real increases in wages. In short, a populist platform. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton was running on a progressive platform. Climate change, globalization of economies, social justice issues, opening the borders, and further expansion of government social programs. Trump welcomed support from blue-collar workers, farmers, manufacturers, and fossil fuel producers. Clinton called half of Trump supporters deplorable and threw out a bunch of labels like racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic. Trump had to state publicly that he disavowed the support of extremist groups. And Clinton actively campaigned to add more voters to the voting rolls, eligible or not, under sanctuary laws. And thus, neither pundits nor pollsters were able to accurately predict the results of the election. I've said before that the American press tends to function in a gigantic, mutually supportive delusion, and I stick by that assessment. Trump pisses off the press establishment who slam him in the reporting. Trump deliberately insults them for their bias, and they claim an assault on free speech. Trump eventually stopped giving press conferences for the most part, effectively abolishing the daily press briefings and communicating directly with the American people via Twitter. Add in a bunch of lawsuits regarding this, and now American politicians cannot block anyone on Twitter or ban a reporter from the press gallery at events no matter how unprofessional their behavior might be. Let me say that again. American politicians cannot do those things anymore. Not just President Trump. You see, when you go to the courts and ask them to clarify whether or not the press has access to politicians, you're not just asking for access to the president. You're asking for unlimited, unfettered access to all politicians, including those who might share your point of view. The press ran wild with reports on unfounded allegations that President-elect Trump had colluded with the Russians to steal the election, because that's the only way that he could have defeated Hillary Clinton, supposedly the most qualified person to ever run for the Oval Office, right? Many, many weeks of investigations later, and the Russian collusion narrative collapsed. In the process, the entire Justice Department was racked with evidence of abuse of authority for political purposes, tarnishing their reputation significantly. Several major figures within the Department of Justice wound up fired because of this investigation. Not because they were probing too deep, but because it turned out that the records showed that they had investigated based on their own political biases. Some representatives suggested that the Electoral College had to support the results of the popular vote in the 2016 election, actively encouraging electors to break faith with the voters they represented. Others called loudly for impeachment, including some who demanded that Donald Trump be impeached before his inauguration. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with the process for impeachment at the federal level, office holders must actually occupy the office from which they will be impeached before impeachment proceedings can begin. 
just as we cannot impeach former presidents, we cannot impeach presidents elect. They are outside the scope and jurisdiction of impeachment. But now impeachment of President Trump during the primary season? That's perfectly acceptable from a legal standpoint. He occupies the office, after all. The constitutional justifications for impeachment are purposefully vague so that Congress doesn't have to wait until the president breaks the law, either. The Supreme Court has ruled that high crimes and misdemeanors effectively means that the president's conduct has become so obnoxious that he cannot perform the duties of his office to work with Congress and the courts to govern the nation. Therefore, the only issue with this impeachment is that the timing is just a little suspicious. You see, waiting for Trump to do something which a sufficient body of congressional members will consider reprehensible just takes patience. Again, Trump is rude, crude, crass, bombastic, and unfiltered. He's going to do or say something which raises an uproar, usually about once a week or so, given the fact that he is bypassing the major media outlets through Twitter, and they are reporting everything that he does as yet another example of how horrible he is. If it wasn't this issue, well, it'd be something else. Now, just in time for the run-up to the Iowa caucuses, a whistleblower report is submitted. Interestingly, the press seems to find out about that report as soon as it happens, although even they have to admit that the whistleblower did not directly witness the alleged conversation and that whistleblower complaints are supposed to be confidential in order to protect the whistleblower's identity. On top of that, the whistleblower is blowing the whistle based on something that is totally inadmissible in a court of law, hearsay evidence. And the major media outlets are reporting enough details for the White House to figure out just who blew the whistle. Maybe they are hoping that Trump discovers the whistleblower's identity and fires him or her. That would certainly make the situation worse, i.e. sell more advertising space on the tsunami of articles which would follow. Conveniently, just a few days after the report was revealed, a bombshell exclusive is blasted all over the media regarding allegations that Trump demanded that the newly elected Ukrainian president, a comedian who ran and won on an anti-corruption platform, investigate Joe and Hunter Biden for corruption. There were even follow-up allegations that Trump had suspended $400 million in military aid to the Ukraine a week before the phone call. The fact that the Ukrainians didn't know about the suspended aid is a mere footnote in these reports. For my part, I have to look at the source of the allegations and by whom they were reported. Anton Garishchenko is a senior assistant to the Interior Minister of the Ukraine. He is also a member of the Ukrainian Parliament and the People's Front, a staunchly anti-Russian right-wing nationalist party. Garishchenko was one of the founders of Mirotvorets, a Ukrainian website which is run by the Security Service of Ukraine, or SBU. The SBU uses this site to dox journalists and former parliamentarians, which in some cases has happened just days before the doxed people in question were murdered. That doesn't prove anything, of course, but it does suggest that Garishchenko is guiding SBU activities, at least indirectly, and his position in the Ukrainian government would allow for this to be much more direct than indirect. It also makes his motives for releasing such information suspect, especially since he released the information to the Daily Beast. The Daily Beast is known for its progressivist reporting and how universally negative its reporting on Donald Trump has been. Yet its reporting, with its known biases, was picked up by many other major outlets and reported as factually accurate. Something doesn't smell right, especially since Garishchenko is reporting secondhand information from a phone call which he didn't witness any more than the whistleblower did. In response, Nancy Pelosi said that she simply cannot ignore the calls for impeachment any longer. Calls which started the instant that the Daily Beast's report was put out on blast by every other outlet. The Democrat presidential candidates are demanding Trump's impeachment, including Joseph Biden, who maybe should keep his mouth shut on this one. You see, old Joe has a history with the Ukrainian prosecutor's office, or to be specific, his son does. Back in 2016, the chief prosecutor of the Ukraine was contemplating investigating Hunter Biden for his association with a company called Burisma. Old Joe demanded that the prosecutor be fired and stated that some $1 billion of U.S. assistance to the Ukraine was on hold. The prosecutor was fired and the financial aid was released. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? 
Sounds almost like Biden did exactly what Trump is now accused of doing. When Biden did it, it was no big deal. But now it's suddenly ground for impeachment inquiries? Now, several investigative articles by reporters have asserted that this didn't actually happen. But old Joe said that it did in public. Other reports have claimed that the entire situation was mischaracterized because Biden was just doing what every other elected official in the Western nations wanted to do by getting the prosecutor fired. That's essentially what Trump mentioned on the phone call, offering the assistance of the Attorney General and his own personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, to investigate. Because if true, it would be a horrible misuse of power by Biden. That funny smell is getting pretty nasty. The fact that this is an impeachment inquiry is quite convenient from a political perspective during the run-up to the 2020 elections. It will poison the well and give whomever the eventual Democrat nominee is another talking point. It's also convenient from an internal politics perspective at the DNC, as old Joe Biden has been slipping a lot in his public appearances. If it leverages him out of the way for another nominee, like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, then all the better, because he doesn't actually look all that strong against Trump when he keeps on handing out talking points which make him look weak, senile, and out of touch. If it doesn't eliminate Biden, well then I'm certain that it can be spun into yet another unsubstantiated conspiracy theory-based attack by the Trump campaign against an honest, much more experienced and qualified nominee in Joseph Biden. Trump, meanwhile, is quietly building up even more support in his core constituencies, blue-collar workers, farmers, and the people who live in flyover states. Mind you, these are people who are less likely to respond to political pollsters when asked for their opinion. Partly this is because they are less interested, and partly it is because they are too busy making ends meet. That's part of the reason why there's an innate sampling bias in national polls. The responses from the flyover states are slanted towards college students, intellectuals from the cities, and local political activists. Not to mention the fact that in many cases the national political distribution is used to weight the polling data instead of the local political distribution limiting the number of conservatives and independents polled. How else can we explain that over the last 20 years, a consistent bias towards liberal and progressive thought has appeared in polling results? I personally give Trump a 60-40 chance of coming out of this latest round of Trumpgate in a stronger position. It will largely depend on whether my suspicions about the sources, reporting, and timing prove to be valid. It will also depend on whether the Democrats have overreached yet again in their attempts to restore the old status quo and balance of power in Washington politics. This one really could go either way, depending on how much spin is put on the story. I think that more Americans are fed up with the amount of spin put on every story than the media outlets realize. Look at the Carson King story. He does something truly good in raising money for a children's hospital and a reporter digs into his social media past to report that when he was 16, he made some stupid, offensive remarks. Carson immediately apologizes, and the people react to the story by digging into the reporter's social media past because of how irritated they are at the character assassination directed towards someone who just raised over a million dollars for a children's hospital. Lo and behold, the reporter has said far worse things and now the Des Moines Register, the entire newspaper organization, is facing a serious backlash. Meanwhile, the donations for the Children's Hospital have continued to pour in, with many people and businesses actually increasing their donations and fundraising efforts. Why? Because even though Carson King said some stupid stuff eight years ago, he is doing something really great to benefit lots of sick children now. That shows maturity, perhaps even beyond his 24 years, and most people recognize that destroying someone when they are doing something this altruistic and nonpartisan is beyond the pale. To me, that indicates something bigger, and I wouldn't be surprised if the major media outlets have missed the mark on a lot of the stories that they're currently reporting. Maybe even on the Trump-Ukraine scandal, which to many is just another attempt to take down the president for doing what every other president in decades has done.